Hello, everyone, and welcome to ImageCon. My name is Sanjay Sarathi, and alongside my guests, Alex Wack and Beckley Mason, we're glad you could join today's session that will explore the highly relevant role video plays in the next generation of visual experiences. Before we get started, one quick administrative note. We will be answering questions after the main part of the panel. So please add your questions to the Q&A section uh, in your player, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So why this topic? It's no surprise a secret that video continues to rise in importance for both B2B and B2C brands as companies understand uh, its value in driving engagement uh, and conversion. There are plenty of statistics on the web as to the impact of video, but one of the more recent ones that jumped out at me is that the number of people who say that video has had a positive ROI on their business has grown from 33% in 2015 to 88% in 2020, so nearly a, a threefold increase over the past five years. So it gives me great pleasure to have Alex uh, from Final Side and Beckley from Bleacher Report, two market leaders, sharing their experiences and opinions on how video is shaping their markets and what lessons each of you as audience members can take away from their experiences. So with that, let's uh, go on to introductions. Uh, Alex, let's start with you. Um, if you can start by telling us a little bit about Final Side, its mission, and your particular role. Yeah, uh, so I am the core product manager here at Final Sight. Um, Final Sight provides our K through 12 schools with digital communications and marketing tools. Um, so with that, uh, we create custom websites for our schools on top of our proprietary CMS um, that is built specifically for the needs of schools and the users at schools to manage um, the content that they need to um, spread and share with their community um, and provide kind of internal and external communication tools um, using that content. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. And, and Beckley, if, if you could do the same and introduce us and tell us a little bit about Bleacher Report and also Playmaker, the studio. Great. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for those who are tuning in and asking questions. Uh, Bleacher Report is a sports media company. We uh, are part of Warner Media, which is a part of AT&T. Uh, and Bleacher Report aims to be the voice for the next generation of sports fans. Um, we tell stories um, through our app, through our website, across social media. Uh, and Playmaker, which is the division that uh, I oversee, is our internal brand agency. So we work with all our external partners who are interested in developing content for our platforms. We also do some traditional creative agency work, but almost everything we do is uh, aimed at creating video that will engage a young audience, um, which is, uh, I think every brand has found, um, the best way to do that is through video and, and going to where they live on social and, and the, the apps and destinations where they frequent. Great, thank you, Beckley. Um, so Alex, uh, let's start with you. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how video is typically leveraged by the schools on your platform and uh, the types of benefits they see from, from using video. Yeah, definitely. So the, the biggest use that we find for our schools are helping to convert um, both our donors, the donors that the schools provide, um, so alumni that want to provide donations and encouraging them to, to donate, and then conversions for um, parents and families to um, create uh, new opportunities for admissions and, and admitting students and applications there. Um, so part of that is um, kind of these inbound marketing tools that we provide, and we find that um, alumni are much more likely to donate when they see where their donations are going to go, which is best expressed through video, um, showing the alumni what is happening on campus, um, how they're educating students, what, um, what opportunities they're providing. But then for parents and families who are considering applying to the school to see really the school community that's out there, 
um, look and see, you know, how, who the other students are um, that are on campus, um, what their professors are teaching out there, um, and really, you know, athletics facilities, um, some of the learning artistic facilities, and just getting an idea and a sense for what it would like, what it would um, be like for the, the students to um, take part and gain an education um, at that school. Great, thank you. Um, Beckley, turning to, to Bleacher Report and, and sports, um, obviously, you know, Bleacher Report is one of the best known media brands and videos, you know, as we know, so critical to the, to the overall sports experience. You know, one of the questions that constantly comes up is whether the increased use of video over the past few years and its, and its many uh, forms has changed how you have thought about your mission and and the role that it plays in overall fan uh, engagement and and the experience. Yeah, our brand story. Uh, you know, I don't know how much everyone on here knows about Bleacher Report, but uh, when it started, it was really uh, a place where people could go and blog and get their sports takes found. So, you know, going back to the earliest expression of this business, it was around. Uh, elevating, curating users, not just kind of the big voices or the broadcast experience. And I think that while our business and perspective and our structures and all these things have changed a ton over the uh, ensuing decade, that I think remains a differentiator for us among the large media companies. And that is that we have uh, a property in a brand that is built not just on showing the most elevated version of the game or of the sport, but also in curating and sharing and elevating and giving a platform to everyday people. Um, and I think that is a reflection of the way that people use phones in general now. I think the quality of the camera in your phone um, years ago would have been thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment. And now everybody's carrying it around. Um, and I think that the expectation for our consumer is that the video they're going to see from us is going to work on that phone. Um, and in this context, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's the context of the broadcast. And when I'm watching an NBA game, and there is, uh, you know, I want it to be widescreen. I want it to be glossy. I want it to be sharp. But there's a user experience that is, I would say, 98% of my experience, which is looking at stuff that my friends and other people shot on their phones. And it doesn't look as polished, um, but there's a wit and a soul and a cleverness to that that our audience has always really responded to. So when we think about our mission, I think we take a very agnostic viewpoint on video production and not saying like, this is exactly how everything we do is going to look and is going to feel, but really thinking about the context in which it's going to be viewed. Um, and then the visual language that we need to employ to tell the story the right way. Right. And it, it sounds like, you know, it's, it's, we see it all the time. I mean, my kids are using their phones to, to film video moment. I mean, sports moments uh, all the time, whether it's their f other friends who are participating at school, even at an amateur moment. So I can only imagine what this must be like at a, at a global scale. Right. And people using it all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, the really funny kind of, uh, tropes of sports videos right now is, or not right now, but you know, over the last few years is people taking video of someone watching the highlight on a TV yeah. and the highlight itself is great. But what we really want is the experience of seeing how it impacts other people. And that dad who flips over the coffee table or the one who wins the bet and is going bananas, like that person becomes the star of the video. And I think that that is a really 
um, fascinating part of how video is created and, and the ubiquity of it is that even within this highlight that costs millions of dollars in terms of equipment and people and investment in the game and getting the stadium and all that, even within that, the most interesting thing is this individual reaction. And I think that our brand and the way that we sort of uh, embrace that, I think is a differentiator for us because we know that the highlight itself is going to be commoditized very quickly. Uh, everyone's going to be able to share it. Everyone's going to be able to get a piece of it. But what is the viewpoint on that that feels more connective and feels more relatable? And almost always that is communicated through video. Yep. Now that's a great point, which is the experience is, is universal because cell phones are everywhere and you you all of a sudden have the ability to to shape the experience and in, in, in the context, as you pointed out, that's most appropriate. Uh, switching gears a little bit back to you, Alex. Um, you know, we we're we're living in strange times these days with with the pandemic, and schools are one uh, market that have had to change quickly to support e-learning. You know, uh, at at all stages of of the whether it's K through twelve and even beyond. Uh, so can you share maybe some of the ways that uh, in these times schools have evolved their use of video uh, over the past few months and and how you think video will change how schools continue to communicate to to their core constituencies? Yeah, I think that the biggest um, you know change that the the spring has has brought on in our schools is creating much more personal content. Um, that really otherwise um, they wouldn't have thought about in the first place. Um, so for a headmaster at an at a independent school um, or the, uh, the superintendents at a district um, would never have thought about recording video themselves. Um, it would have been this um, expectation that on their website to their communities, they'd have this high value of production um, and they would, you know, there'd be concern about, you know, what am I going to say? How is this going to be perceived? Um, where now they're able to record themselves. And, and just like Beckley said, you know, the, the quality of the, the video that they can shoot themselves on their camera um, is much higher. Um, and I think that then brings with it this much more personal experience that um, can be brought to the community. So rather than a headmaster addressing, you know, or, or producing this video that really tries to um, communicate the the, the values of their community, they're now able to demonstrate that by just talking about their community, right? A kind of much more honest conversation that they're having um, just in front of their phone, right? So they're, they're shooting a address um, to the community um, from their backyards, right? Or from their living room, um, whereas usually they would be up on a podium in front of, you know, addressing the entire school. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of a much um, you know, nicer way to see, you know, these, these heads of school um, and districts in their, you know, quote unquote, natural environment, right, where they, they actually live. Um, and that, I think, is something that um, is going to, you know, continue to be used going forward, that um, because these, because schools have been, you know, forced into providing um, this, you know, much more authentic content in, in, you know, this much more, you know, low or not low production, but much more um, homegrown content um, that going forward, you know, they understand and are no longer concerned or, or scared of doing that. Um, but they're really going to start seeing the values of it um, out there today. Um, I think another, you know, major thing was in the last spring, you know, the, the, the news constantly was covering um, graduations, right? These seniors who had worked um, all four years to um, finally complete their, their education, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, had that, um, that completion of their senior year occur during a, you know, a very strange time. And so having, you know, video, um, you know, having the ability to honor those students um, via video is obviously, you know, not the same thing as an in-person graduation, but it's certainly a great way to still honor and 
provide some type of um, achievement for those students. So, we, you know, we've seen the news covers all sorts of, you know, ways of honoring those students um, in person. But, you know, we have seen schools use really creative ways um, using video to do that. Um, I think that my favorite story out there is a, a school that um, recorded, you know, a montage of the, the seniors. So using their senior year photos um, and, and showing each one of the seniors that's graduating, but then having those seniors kind of provide a little bit of bio about them, um, you know, explain what their most fond memories of high school was. Um, and then the, the school took and compiled all of these together um, and had a, uh, a drive-in, um, had everybody go to a drive-in movie theater and screened this graduation video for all the seniors and their families to watch in a, still a socially distanced uh, manner. Um, and then, you know, all the families had the opportunity to, you know, have a, be sent this recording, but it was a really nice way of honoring these um, graduating seniors in front of and literally, you know, within the proximity of the, um, the communities that they would have been graduating with had there not been um, the social distancing in place. Yeah, and I, I really like uh, your use of the word personal because I think uh, that that really comes into, into motion in, in these types of environments. Um, my wife and I were watching our, our daughter's high school graduation, you know, where everything was done virtually. And one of the biggest comments we made is we get to learn a lot more about the students because they were able to do some really interesting things with the videos than we would you know, sitting in a grandstand, you know, you know, 400 meters away, watching people walk across to pick up their diploma. And we thought it was really quite engaging, actually, even though it was not, uh, uh, it was not interactive, it was still engaging. And I think that was one of the things that really came out of that just uh, last weekend. So thank you. Thank you for that, Alex. Uh, Beckley, you had mentioned um, in in your previous conversation around, you know, different types of video production. And, and we know video production budgets vary greatly in, in the media market. Um, what, what trends are you seeing in terms of how video production is being used in, in the sports media market uh, uh, today? Yeah, I mean, I think the pandemic um, is an accelerant of a lot of trends is probably some stuff that is going to bounce back and some stuff that won't. Uh, I think one of the trends that is probably here to stay is that I think there's kind of a, a very high level of production, you know, your Nike $2 million spot. Um, and then there's, more running gun kind of shot on phones, GoPros, those sorts of things that are really feel approachable from a production point of view. And then there's sort of like this middle class of productions and those require a lot of people. They require the video village. They require um, you to come in proximity with like a set is a lot of strangers. Um, and uh, and they and they require the talent to interact with all those people. And I think that the appetite for that type of video is going to shrink for two reasons. One, I think producers and talent are not going to want to take the risk when it isn't a huge brand statement that there's tons of planning around and kind of it's a, it's a really important moment for the talent as well. Um, and then I think because for the last few months, nobody has been making that type of video and everyone's seeing that if you shoot things on your phone or you shoot things remotely or you have the right idea, maybe there isn't a ton of production value, but the performance is there. So now it's been exposed that, okay, I've been paying this premium for a production that is getting me the same results as something that costs a 10th or a 30th of that. And there's never going to be a replacement of an ad that has LeBron, Serena, you know, I keep going back to Nike, but like they load up their ads with value and that's why they get shared and that's why they get um, passed around for a long time and they're iconic. But if you aren't going to invest in that way, 
the ROI on the incremental dollars from sort of running gun style, especially if you're planning to reach a digital audience is pretty low. And I think that brands are, and creative agencies are being exposed to that, which I think will create a certain commoditization of video assets that maybe hasn't been, that's been resisted by the creative industry, but um, I think will be start to be demanded more and more by clients. And so at that point, it'll be really important for creative teams, uh, which I'm a part, to be able to clearly articulate what the value, not just of the production is, but of the thinking, of the insight, of the connection to audience and context. Um, because the simple like, hey, we know how to shoot a video with expensive cameras, I don't think is going to get it done anymore. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, and and I think we're we're seeing it obviously not just with with the work you're doing at the Bleacher Report, but through things that we're seeing in in a variety of even social channels as well that that come through you know all all of our all of our feeds. Um, I'd love to understand a little more, and maybe start with you, Alex. Um, at, at a software level, at a platform level, you know, what are sorts of things that Final Sight has done, right, to take advantage of some of the uh, the trends, not just that Beckley's talked about, but you talked about, to to take advantage of videos overall uh, and to make those personal uh, connections even even more engaging. Yep, uh, we have really focused on trying to remove roadblocks and increase. Um, the, you know, allow the just general community to contribute videos, um, to, um, the schools that are out there. Um, so allow, uh, parents and teachers and students to be able to upload videos, um, directly to their websites, um, for then the directors of communication, let's say, to, um, take those videos and compile them into, you know, slideshows or, or really collections of videos that they can provide, um, onto their websites, um, very easily. So I think that, you know, traditionally, um, there had been this use of, you know, Google Drive or other services to, um, distribute that information. You know, it was still kind of this, um, you know, looser um, collection of those videos. But by um, building into our website these tools that allow um, the, those groups of um, the community um, to upload that video and then for the, 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 the members of the school that are managing um, what video is distributed through their website um, to, you know, directly pull that content together, I think it has really helped lower um, those barriers and remove those barriers to, um, you know, provide that community generated content. Um, in addition to that, we have, you know, made a lot of changes to our platform to uh, make sure we're able to better support the delivery of that video, which, um, you know, Cloudinary has done a, a lot to help us, you know, improve the efficiency of that and, and you know, dynamically, you um, dynamically, you know, adjust to whatever platform um, our visitors might be hitting our websites with, um, but also, you know, making sure that um, the video players are up to, up to standards, that um, it's very easy for visitors of the website to understand um, how to access that video um, and to play that video in a, in a very convenient way. Um, one of the other um, things that we've done, and it was really before, you know, the, the world started changing at the beginning of the year, um, is that we began um, partnering with services that allowed us to provide streaming um, video out there to members of the community. So, um, you know, the big thing is for a lot of our schools, and, and it's chiefly the parents that are interested in alumni, is um, the athletics. So a little bit of um, Beckley with the Bleacher Report, um, athletics, you know, is, is driving a lot of the views to their websites. Um, and there are parents, you know, particularly boarding schools who might not be present for um, their, their son's basketball game, their daughter's field hockey game, who still want to be able to watch that. Um, so we have platforms and tools for um, those parents to remotely live stream those videos. And we're still able to track, you know, the action of those events, whether it's a, a field hockey field outdoor, a basketball court indoors. But then also, you know, in addition to that, um, 
capturing, you know, arts and performances. So be that a, a, a concert that the band is putting on, the, the chorus is putting on, or a, you know, musical performance that um, members of the drama department are putting on as well. So just kind of an overall, um, you know, building up of the, the video tools and the accessibility of those video tools for um, the, our school's communities. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. It sounds really, really interesting. And I know schools are going through a lot of different ways, especially in these times, to figure out how to how to build. Um, it's not just more personal, but also faster uh, engagement with uh, with their constituencies. Yeah, it's uh, so cool. Also, that they can you know then have those videos. Like I, you know, when I was in high school, I had game tapes, and I was you know going trying to get recruited and stuff, and I would send the tapes out, and you had to like mail the tapes to a guy. He would put it together, and you, and I have no idea what happened to those, um, but that these kids will be able to also, and parents will be able to have those in a digital space, on the cloud, whatever, um, for the future is, is so cool. Yeah, the, 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 the retention component of it is, is and, and the, the lifetime value of those videos is something that's really interesting. It's an interesting concept in and of itself that, uh, that we, we probably could dedicate a whole session to just based on that. Um, Beckley, in, in, in terms of the advantages of video, are there specific uh, advantages that agencies like yourselves um, uh, or media companies, um, they may not be as aware of today that you've put into, that you've that come to the realization of that you, you really understand um, that, you know, video has significant advantages over traditional media that um, that you'd be willing to share. Sure. Well, I think from a you know from a very like nuts and bolts perspective, as a media product, video is great um, because it creates a lot of space for brands to um, enter into content, whether that's an end card, whether that's um, a brought to you by, or there, which is kind of, then this is what we specialize in, whether there's an engagement in the brand and the content uh, itself. And I think that if you think of um, the idea that your brand or your product, let's say, is going to be shown in some kind of marketing communication, video is how you show exactly how it works. It's how you show someone not just endorsing it, but using it. Um, and I think that there's an enormous power and it's a, like, it's a simple thought and I'm sure everyone else has it, but like there's a big difference between um, having Patrick Mahomes, a picture of him on Google's website and having a video of him saying, hello, Google and using the product. Um, and for us, because a lot of the video that we produce and put out there is, you know, sort of in reporting news and commenting and um, kind of creating a flow of information, this video goes into that flow as just like you're learning this or being entertained by that, you can learn and be entertained by advertising communication. So I think for us, video's flexibility in terms of um, not just the creative output, but how the brand shows up in it and what's the right level of kind of um, high touch for that is a really valuable part of our business because it allows us to have one team that can fulfill a huge variety of kind of brand needs, whether you're trying to drive consideration, whether you're trying to drive trialing. Um, these are all things that video is flexible enough to support and enable. Right. Yep. That That's very, very true. Um, before I get back to uh, Beckley and Mason with their sort of final thoughts, just a reminder that you can ask questions in the Q&A section of your player. And, uh, it uh, we'll answer those questions as, as soon as we're done. So let's um, maybe wrap up uh, Alex and Beckley by 
maybe providing the audience with two or three pieces of advice that you'd give to somebody, uh, whether it's um, a creative person, an agency, uh, a, a, a B2B business, a B2C business on, on use of video or potentially how to think about it uh, as, um, as they think about their business. So Beckley, maybe we start with you and then we'll, we'll go to Alex. Yeah, um, I think the thing I would uh, advocate for is thinking about who's making your videos and um, knowing that you can have a really talented staff and a really talented group, um, but there's uh, doesn't mean that they're expert and native in the video language that you want to use to reach the people you want to use. And um, I get asked all the time, like, how is Bleacher Report the way it is? And how do you guys come up with this stuff? And it's like, because we give 24 year olds cameras and give them phones and let them make things the way they want to make them. Uh, and I think that there's sort of no substitute for um, the like lived experience that these creators have. And so I would say if you want to use video in a really authentic and digital way, um, give power to young people, um, people of color who are sort of driving the trends on these platforms and let them uh, kind of let them cook and let them do their thing because um, that will be the way to have the most authentic expression of your brand or your story for that platform will be to give your story to people who are really um, setting the trend on that platform. Great. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I think it um, comes down to putting, you know, uh, effectively deputizing the members of your community or your business um, to create that video. So just like kind of Beckley was saying, um, having that authentic content coming from the, the members of your community or business that are actually reaching and are, and are um, targeting the audience that you really want to connect with. Um, I think one of the things we've seen pretty frequently now is, you know, as admissions officers cannot actually directly meet with the students that are coming into their schools, um, they've had to, and I, I think it's been a much more effective, you know, manner, create these accepted student videos. So the admissions director actually sends um, with the acceptance letter, acceptance email, you know, this customized personal video saying, thank you. Um, thank you, Alex, for um, accept, you know, coming to and submitting a um, application to our school. You know, we'd really like to see you. Um, they have some type of background about that student, and they, you know, they talk about that um, to really make them feel, you know, that it's not just this machine, right, that's reaching out to um, the students that are out there, the alumni that are out there, but they're actually personalizing those videos, which is, you know, something that you can do as a business, as a school, um, as an individual, um, because you do have these tools accessible to you. Um, and in addition to that, you know, even though um, you might not have at certain times the ability to, you know, run things, you know, do uh, um, orientation as you normally would, you will um, learn new ways of using digital technology to provide those same experiences where you might not necessarily need to have all students on campus to do an orientation, right? You, there might be limitations of, um, you know, kids to get on campus um, that you know, they would have to send, um, send kids out there, right? They'd have to, to fly out there and they would have to um, you know, come from different countries, drive across the, the country just to come for a week to get that orientation. And now they can, from their, you know, from their own home, um, have those same experiences. No, I really, I really like the theme you brought up around trust and Beckley too, right? The, the idea that, you know, video creation, uh, you use the words deputize, Alex, which I really liked, and the the idea that it's it's gone from the hands of a few to into the hands of many people, and that allows some of that creative juices to 
to filter their way into into your business, into both of your businesses, and uh, that also lends a certain sense of authenticity, I think, to to that process as well, which uh, which I think is really interesting in two very very different industries like yourselves. Um, but but I think has been has been has been instructive to understand. Uh, so once again, I just want to, on behalf of the audience listening, thank you both very much, Alex and, and Beckley, for participating in today's session. Uh, I think there were a couple of really interesting themes that came out of it. Um, I think uh, the concept, Beckley, that you talked about uh, around the, the essentially the ubiquity of cell phones and how uh, that can capture not just the event, but the context of the event. Um, uh, Alex, I really liked how you know, schools uh, on your platform are really thinking about the use of video in terms of con creating those personal connections, which are so important both for alumni, for potential students, for existing parents. Uh, and then the last theme, theme we sort of mentioned here, which is this notion of trust and, and, and enabling a broader community of creators to to build and, and support um, essentially your mission. And, and I think that's really, that's really powerful. So with that, I, I think we'll now turn to answering some of the Q&A that's come in. And uh, so I'll take a moment just to read through that and, and get back to you, Beckley and Alex. Uh, a question that has come in is uh, whether uh, you know, your thoughts on how you differentiate or the secrets behind creating a great video versus a good video. Are there, uh, are there things you look for that go, wow, this is great versus, yeah, this is good. It could be better. Either of you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, you know, one of the biggest problems that we see in schools videos is they're scripted. Right. The, the, the marketing department kind of comes up with a script of what they want the students to say verbatim um, versus some of the better videos we see where they're just they're, they're A question is posed to the students out there, the teachers. And that's where I think some of that pre-recorded video helps where they're able to just kind of get out all this information, all of these effectively sound bites that are there. Um, and it, again, kind of going back to that idea of authenticity. You can actually tell that the the speaker um, is talking about something they really believe, rather than being handed this you know marketed script that they need to read to hit these bullet points to you know sell the school, rather than share their feelings about the school. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think enthusiasm is something that is always uh, really really hard to fake effectively. I mean, there's a million other components that can go into whether a video is, is good or bad. I think another one for me that I'm uh, always really paying attention to is just like the pace of how quickly are we getting into the meat of what we're doing. And, uh, you know, kind of cold opens have become a really effective tool, uh, especially on socially distributed videos where you're kind of opening with five seconds that maybe comes later in the video, but like really grabs you. And then you're getting into sort of the introductory and setting the scene. Uh, I think people really expect to be given something really interesting right off the bat. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're always paying attention to. Uh, and then I think, you know, when something works, it, it's often because it really works on the platform. And so taking a really platform specific approach and thinking about the user experience and are, is this something that we want people to be sitting down, laptop open, watching for 10 minutes? Is it something where we want to, to grab their attention as they are uh, going through their social feeds? I mean, I think really considering the UI is a really important part of, of even creating the rubric for whether something is good or not. Yeah, again, context, obviously, as, as we talked about during the, the main session is so critical to, to understanding the differences between uh, how you engage with your users. Uh, here's an interesting one. Um, in these times, if you could or would rename the word video uh, to what's going on, would you? 
And if so, what would the suggested name be? Maybe you, I'll start with the first part, which is a little easier. It doesn't put you on the spot. Would you change uh, the, cons uh, the, the notion of video to something different? This may be like too philosophical for me to even <laughs> comprehend. Like, what, are, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting is uh, maybe we can take it. Uh, there's another question that's come in related to AR and VR and mm -hmm. uh, and uses of that, which are sort of extensions sometimes of what people think of as live video. But do you see AR and VR becoming more relevant in uh, maybe the sports world is is something that sees a bunch of that? How, how does that play in, in the in the sports market? Well, I'll tell you what, like the NBA and MLB playing games with no real fans and sort of like creating these virtual fans. And then I assume, you know, the next step there is like a virtual fan experience, right? It's like, how do I, if I'm not at the game, can I watch the, uh, you know, watch the game from this vantage point, from this special vantage point? Can I hook up with my Uber Eats and get, you know, something delivered that would be like ballpark food. Is there some special access to that? And I think, you know, to come back to the, to the first question a little bit, I do think the definitions of video are collapsing in a way because what is an experience versus what is video and, um, you know, video, I think implies, uh, a more passive experience than it really is becoming. And that's even the case in how a user maybe toggles between feeds or angles within, you know, an NBA game. If you can choose which camera you want to watch the game from, it's still video, but it's a more and more active experience. Um, I'm sure there'll be some like terrible marketing name for this that we all start using and not even thinking about, but are just cringing from, uh, mm -hmm in the next month or so, but I think in sports, the traditional model of the broadcast is still enormously important because the vast, vast majority of us experience the game passively watching it that way. But I think the, the distance between first and second screen experience and passive and engaged experience is rapidly collapsing. And, you know, if you don't want to pay, pay 200 bucks to sit shoulder to shoulder with 20,000 strangers right now. And I think that's uh, the, you know, pretty good percentage of us. Uh, you need something else. And so I think also sports leagues are really incentivized to figure out what's the next level of fan experience that isn't in, in stadium right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that's, uh, I think even it, it's been strange sometimes even watching uh, in our family, we love to watch soccer. We've been watching the, the end of the English Premier League and you have the, you know, they have the essentially f virtual fan noise played through the TV. Uh, and it's, it's a little odd. Our son, my son and I were just talking about how just odd that is. Um, yeah. but it's, but it's I, mean, I actually love, you know, when you can hear what they're saying to each other and hear yeah. what the coach is yelling. I mean, yeah. I don't know if they want to do that in perpetuity, but it's a pretty cool, like sort of slice of life to be able to hear that kind of thing. Um, and in the NBA games, you know, you hear all the, what the bench is saying really clearly. Yeah. I would probably rather hear that than like 10,000 drunk people, you know? Yeah. Well, I think we have time for one more question. So one of the topics that, you know, constantly comes up is this notion of privacy uh, as it relates to, um, you know, people and, and context in, in videos. How do you both address these notions of privacy in your um, in your respective fields or as you think about both video creation and delivery? Yeah, one of the, I think, interesting and unique things about, um, about schools out there is that there is generally a release form that every parent has to sign off to say, you know, any, any marking materials will be created, you know, we need you to release the image of your son or daughter. Um, and a lot of times we will see instances where, you know, a, a videographer is taking, you know, a, a video of a, 
a school event out there and one or more of those students will actually be present. Um, and so for schools, it's kind of this constant um, list that they have of the students who do not have um, permission to be shown on video. Um, so we kind of generally, that's, that's usually the strategy we give our schools is maintain a list of who those students are um, and review that video before you make it um, available, which for the live stream video is very difficult um, because you almost need to position the camera in a specific way. And in some of those you know, instances, it is a matter of protecting, you know, putting password um, protection in front of any video that you might, that those students might be in. So for promotional materials, it's one thing, but if it is like a public um, forum that they're hosting at the school, if it's an athletics game that's being live streamed, um, so long as those are password protected or in some way um, protected from the public being able to access them, that's that's really our, our bigger kind of strategy that, that we can actually um, assist schools with rather than um, a specific, that's the tools that we provide rather than a specific strategy. Yeah, I think it's less of a concern for us. I mean, there's certainly some internal communications that, you know, are sort of typically password protected and that kind of thing. I think where it's interesting for us is we interact a lot with our users and let them submit videos, um, create their own videos sort of based off what we're doing. Uh, sometimes, you know, I think we're like looking for ways, whether it's through our app or other ways to uh, allow video to be created by users and then distributed. Um, and certainly there's, you know, there's some forms, forms and paperwork you got to go through for that. Uh, but I think the big thing for us is just making sure that um, people are excited to be a part of what we're doing, uh, that the people who were requesting video from or planning to use that they're in a, you know, that they feel good about being on our platform. Um, but in terms of sort of, I guess, privacy and probably the more like intra-company sense, um, you know, that's, that's probably where it shows up more rather than in my specific business. Right. And I think we're at, uh, at time, and I just want to, again, thank both of you, Alex and Beckley, for your time, your insights, and, and really uh, some of the advice you've provided the attendees on how to think about video and how to create greater engagement through video, no matter what industry you're in. And for those of you in the audience, I encourage you to... Um, Join us uh, the rest of this week. We have a couple of sessions tomorrow with uh, Disney, the Children's Place, and Publicist Sapient talking about a variety of different uh, topics, which I think will be highly engaging. Once again, related to the role of uh, the, the notion of visual experiences. And then again, on uh, Thursday, we have a number of both live and on-demand sessions as well that uh, we encourage you to listen to. So again, uh, thank you, Alex and Beckley. Thank you to everybody in the audience. And we look forward to seeing you the rest of the week. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.